I want to begin by telling you about a day in my life, August 31st, 2011. And if you don't remember, that was a Wednesday. It was the end of summer, and so the day dawned beautiful, bright, clear. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and there was no chance of rain, and it was warm. And it was a hump day, you know, that day of the week that we love in which the weekend is closer rather than further away. So August 31st, 2011 was very much just an average day, except this was the day that I was going to commit suicide. This was the day that I got in my red Dodge Dakota pickup truck and I drove from my home in Penryn and I drove to the Forest Hill Bridge. And I parked my car, my vehicle in a spot that I had scouted out months before. And this brings up an important point that suicide is almost never spontaneous. I had thought and ruminated and imagined this day for months and months before. And so as I pulled into that spot, I stopped and I turned off the engine and I sat there for just a moment. And I was searching, hoping, looking for some thought, some visceral experience, something that would tell me that what I was about to do was not a good idea. That the world would, in fact, not be better off without me. But no thought came. No feeling of grace or peace came. And so I reached to my right, into the passenger seat, and I grabbed the suicide note that I had typed out. A note that in part read, to my family and friends. I have decided that the time has come for me to go. I am choosing to end my life so I can be free of the pain in my heart and soul, the betrayal of my mind, and the depth of self-hatred that I feel. I have become the burden I wish I never would. My failings as a husband, brother, son, and friend are too innumerable to count, and yet I review the long list of my mistakes at the end of every day. I fear I will continue to be a drag on those around me, a damaged shell of a boy, not yet close to being a man. And I took the note and I placed it right in the center of the dash. And I took the keys out of the ignition and I placed them on top of the note. And I got out of the car and then I spun back around to make sure that the door was unlocked. And I walked, walked down to the center point of the Forest Hill Bridge, that point that stands 730 feet above the North Fork of the American River. 500 feet further off the ground than the Golden Gate Bridge. And on August 31st, 2011, there was a four and a half foot suicide barrier and I pressed my body up against that barrier. And at that moment, there was a cool rush of air that came up from the river below. And I felt this eerie sense of calm, this coolness that had come over my body. I don't know how long I stood there, but it was long enough for somebody to notice. And long enough for somebody to pick up a phone and call 911. And long enough for a sheriff to come and make contact and then create connection. And in the creation of the connection, he created hope. And hope that got me off the bridge into an emergency room and then to a psychiatric hospital where I would spend the next 15 days. And when people found out I was in the psychiatric hospital and why, the fact that I was suicidal, they couldn't process it. It made no sense. They said, David Bartley, Woody Bartley? is in the psychiatric hospital and Woody Bartley was going to commit suicide? But the truth is, sometimes what hurts the most can't be seen. Sometimes great agony and pain and despair and hopelessness lies just behind a forced smile or a distracting joke. And people saw me at the time I was married, and my wife Deanna and I at the time were running a large, nationally recognized end-of-life animal sanctuary called A Chance for Bliss. And the sanctuary was home to as many as 100 animals at any one time. 25 horses, 23 dogs, nine pot pigs, goats and sheep and ducks and geese. We, we had a, fur, a, a steer, Ferdy, who stood six foot one at the back. We had a turkey named Thomas that every night would put himself to sleep in a horse trailer. And we had a duck named Darcy who had been critically wounded so she couldn't be outside in the pond with the rest of the ducks and the geese. So, of course, she slept inside in the house in the large jacuzzi bathtub where she enjoyed the bubbles. And the sanctuary was an extraordinary place. And because we looked for animals that had no chance of being adopted, we did no adoptions. And in 20 years of doing this sort of work, we'd had 90 animals transition, pass away with dignity, knowing that they were loved and respected. And on June 2nd of 2010, the sanctuary was the cover story in the life section of USA Today. And yet, 14 months later, there I was, standing on the bridge on the very edge of moving past a point past which there is no return. The monster 
in this case clinical depression, after 40 years of speaking to me, not so much in audible words, but in absolute thoughts, you are worthless, you are useless, you are ugly and stupid and weak, nobody loves you and everybody would be better off without you. It had convinced me of its lies. And on August 31st, 2011, I turned to the monster and I said, you're right. And he took me by the hand and led me to that point. But I was saved. I was turned around and brought here so I could stand on this stage, on the stage of the finest Christian university in the world, to share with you my story in the form of answering three what's. What happened? What had gotten me to that point of being suicidal? And what have I learned, not just about mental illness, but about the grace of mental health? And more importantly, what can we do? What can we do for those of us who suffer, who, those of us who still need to manage our condition on a day-to-day -day basis? And what can we do for our brother or sister who is suffering? So first, what? What happened? Now, mental illness typically doesn't come about because of a singular condition. It's usually a confluence of things. And in my case, that's exactly what happened. It reads like a cruel equation. Genetics plus trauma equals mental illness. My grandfather committed suicide when my father was five years old. My father, in turn, suffered from clinical depression his whole life until he passed away at the tender age of 41. So we have grandfather, father, and me, and I inherited this genetic predisposition. But it's important to note, I have three older brothers, and while they are silly and at times annoying, they are in no way mentally ill. So just because we inherit a particular genetic predisposition, it doesn't mean that we are condemned to experience that malady. But when you add trauma, particularly childhood trauma, into the genetic fertile bed of mental illness, you have basically assured that that soul at one point in their life is going to suffer. I don't know what my grandfather's trauma was, but I'm certain it was present. I know my father's trauma was losing his dad at five years old. I was seven when my father died. And when I was 11, I was raped twice by a trusted community leader. Genetics plus trauma equals mental illness. And people will ask me, they say, Woody, what is it like to be in the grips of depression? And the easiest way is to tell a story about one of the animals that came to the sanctuary. Homer was one of the many potbelly pigs that came to the sanctuary. And, and most everybody knows what a potbelly pig is. It's a shrunken down version of its larger cousin. Homer had been kept in what amounted to a small box. And pigs are intelligent and social and highly sensitive. And Homer had been isolated into this dark space and subjected to torture and abuse and neglect. And that's what it feels like on the days that mental illness and depression holds me by the throat. That's what it feels like when our brother and sister is overwhelmed by anxiety. The condition controls are psychologically, physically, and spiritually. It is a horrific system. It is a horrific process. It is a horrific feeling that will ultimately drain a soul of hope. And hopelessness is the ultimate dangerous spot that you can stand on. Hopelessness can bring you to a point where you can make a decision past which and go to a point past which there is no turning around. And it was hopelessness was in the space that I was when I went into the psychiatric hospital, but that's actually where I learned about mental illness. I remember sitting down on the first day that I was in the psychiatric hospital and a doctor sitting, sat in front of me and said, David, you're suffering from a medical condition. You're not suffering from a spiritual deficiency. You're not suffering from a moral dilemma. You're suffering from a condition that's much like cancer, much like heart disease, much like diabetes. David, you didn't do anything wrong. David, you didn't choose your genetics. And David, you didn't choose your trauma. And David, you didn't choose your mental illness. And then the doctor actually took me by the hand. And he looked me in the eye and he said, David, it's not your fault. And then he repeated, he said, David, it's not your fault. Now, mental illness has the incestuous ability to convince the sufferer that they are the cause of their own suffering. And so when this soul said those words to me, it was like God was speaking to me. It was like somebody had taken a weight 
off my shoulders and allowed me for the first time in more than 40 years to stand up, to let go of what had been holding me captive for so long. And then I went through my time and went through my healing at the psychiatric hospital and I made a friend. Now, a psych ward is not necessarily where you make friends. There is no meetup group in the psych ward. But Don and I connected. Don and I created this friendship. Don was another middle-aged man whose condition of depression had convinced him that he was worthless, had drawn him to the point of hopelessness, drawn him to the very edge of putting a gun to his head and ending his life. And so we had a similar story, and we connected, and we bonded, and we shared, and we had this amazing experience of grace in a place that you would not expect it to be. We both got out of the hospital at the same time, and two weeks after we got out of the hospital, Don called me on the phone. And he said, Woody, how are you doing? And I said, I'm okay. I said, how are you? And he said, you know what? I'm actually doing really well. And I said, give me some of what you got, brother. And he said he had found a men's depression support group, and he had gone to the first meeting, and he had found it incredibly helpful, and he said, I think you should go as well. If you're looking for me on Tuesdays between 6 and 8 p.m., you will find me in that group. For the last six and a half years, I have met with this band of brothers, this group of middle-aged men, all who suffer from some form of depression or anxiety or bipolar. And for two hours every week, we get to love one another and care for one another and boost one another up. We share and we listen and we encourage and we support and we help guide one another through our week. And while I learned about mental illness in the psychiatric hospital, it was I learned about mental health in this group. And the epitome of my experience has been the creation of a wellness plan that is at the center of my life. In the words of another speaker, I have put my self-care on a pedestal. And knowing that the condition of depression impacts all of me, my body, my mind, and my spirit, wellness this traveling from mental wellness to mental wellness and keeping me moving in the right direction can only happen if I attend to the totality of who I am. And so for my body, it's careful attention to my sleep hygiene. It's careful attention to my diet, knowing there's more neurotransmission that happens in my gut than does in my head. It's going to the gym four to five days a week. It's being outside each and every day. For my mental wellness, it is meeting with a specially trained counselor once a week. It's participation in the depression support group. It's additional counseling with a Jungian psychiatrist who is specially trained that I get to be with once a month. And it's taking my medication each and every day, even on the days that I feel well. And taking it not with resistance, but with reverence, actually putting it in my hands and thanking God for the creation of something that I can put in my body in concert with everything well that allows me to experience mental health. But of course, the foundation of my wellness comes in my relationship with God, in my communion with spirit. And then it's service work. It's standing up and telling my story in the humble hopes to increase awareness of this crisis that our society faces, to let people know what mental illness is and what it isn't, and to give that soul who may be suffering the reminder that your diagnosis is not your identity, that there is the possibility for you to move from a place of illness to a place of health, and your divine birthright as a child of God is to be and experience mental health. But I realize the greatest blessing that has happened to me over this last six and a half years is the restoration of my faith. Because up until the point that I was standing on that bridge, I thought God had forgotten me. I thought God had forsaken me. I thought God had turned his back on me. But now I realize in looking back, Almighty God was there with me the entire time. God was with me in the form of the officer. God was with me in the form of the physician in the emergency room. God was with me in the form of the doctor in the psychiatric hospital, in the form of Don, my new friend in the psychiatric hospital, in the form of my men's depression support group. God has been with me in the form of Bryce and Joe Jessup, this amazing couple who I met at California Family Fitness more than two years ago and has become an integral part of my life. They have become like a mom and dad to me. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. 
And isn't that the way that God works? All sneaky and clever, <laughs> omnipotent and all over the place and unconditional? Show off. <laughs> and I've come to realize that that's exactly the way that God works. God, by uniting us, by bringing us together, by the mighty power of connection, God creates hope. Connection creates hope and hope heals. And while it has been written of faith, hope, and love that love is the greatest, with all due respect, I would actually say it is hope that is the greatest. For it is not without love that people will perish. It is without hope that people will perish. Hope restores, hope revitalizes, hope replenishes, hope renews a parched soul. And we saw this at the sanctuary time and time again. Animals that came to the sanctuary were depleted, were exhausted, suffering from abuse and neglect. They were depressed. They were hopeless. And yet when dogs became part of a pack and horses part of a herd and geese part of a caggle, they became renewed. Deanna and I, my former wife, had created unknowingly the system in which we took care of their body, their mind, and their spirit. And the transformation that we witnessed was nothing short of spectacular. And of all the beings that became renewed, my beloved Homer was the most extraordinary. He, when he came, was afraid of his own shadow. He could barely lift his head, and yet when he came to the sanctuary, as soon as his hooves were part of the ground, he began to heal. And little by little by little, he not only lifted his head, but he came to own the sanctuary. I was just there hoping for a nut, just looking after Homer. And because he had lived in this box, Deanna and I allowed him to reconnoiter wherever he wanted. And there was one particular day that I knew my beloved pig had made it all the way back, had made it from hellness to wellness. On this particular day, we welcomed in a new horse. And this new horse was Tank. And as the name would suggest, Tank was a large draft horse. He was a Percheron. Beautifully white, snow-colored, and he looked like a unicorn. And he was huge. He was about six foot one. And Homer, of course, is down here. Well, Homer's in a far, far pasture as we're getting Tank settled, and all of a sudden his head pops up. And he said, what's going on? So he comes trucking over. And it's incredible how fast pop -belly pigs can move. Well, he comes up within about 12 inches of Tank. And he puts his nose up and he, he sniffs him a little bit. And both Tank and I are wondering, what's going on here? And then I watch Homer do this full circle around Tank. And the whole time he's looking up at him. Tank up here, Homer down here. Now I watch Tank kind of step back a little bit. But before he can, Homer takes two steps forward, climbs up Tank's left leg, and starts to hump him. Like... <laughs> Wow, you don't see that every day. <laughs> now, what's the point of the story? The point of the story is, when, and there, Bryce, I promise you, there is a, there is a, there's, there's a point here. <clears throat> when you're held captive by depression, you can barely lift your head. You are absent of hope. You are absent of joy. You are absent of spunk. But when you can become connected, when you be can become revitalized, you get to be a silly, spunky, stupid, happy, joy-filled boy. That's what you get to be. Connection creates hope and hope heals. So the answer to the third what is, what do we do to help ourselves? What do we do to help one another when we're in the midst of this? And it's to create connection. And there's three ways that I want to share with you this morning in the ways that we can create connection. All ways in which we are qualified. All ways in which we are capable. It's recognition, understanding, and expression. Recognition is the gateway to connection and names are the gateway to recognition. Dale Carnegie said it best when he said, To a person, the sound of that person's name is the sweetest sound in any language. And think about how true that is. I'd like you to imagine a time that somebody remembered your name and you had no expectation that they would. Or better yet, a time that you hoped somebody would remember your name and they did. How did it make you feel? Be honest. It made you feel good, didn't it? It made you feel like you were included, like you belong. It made you feel like you mattered. If we're looking to create connection with another and make a difference in the life of somebody who may be suffering, we can start by remembering their name. 
Next, we go to understanding. And understanding is this fertile place for connection. And this is important because sometimes the behaviors of others is baffling to us. We're like, what up, dude? And in fact, in our moment of frustration, possibly our moment of fear, we actually may be forced or maybe find ourselves saying, what's wrong with you? But in the place of understanding, if we use curiosity to a path of understanding and slightly change that question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. The first is sticky with judgment. The second is fluid in understanding. We create the space for someone to tell their story. We got a call one day from the, sanction, from the animal shelter in Auburn. It seems that someone had dropped off an old basset hound, caramel colored, swayed back like an old pony, no teeth on the right hand side, so his tongue hung out. And it seemed what happened was an old man had come into the shelter with this equally aged dog. And the old man went up to the staff and said, I found this dog, and I thought he should have a home. And so the staff was like, oh, my God, thank you so much. If you would please fill out this information about where you found him and where we could get in touch with you, we'll take him in the back and see if he's microchipped. So the old man did what he was asked, and the staff came back and said, we're in luck, he's microchipped. And then the staff member compared the information that the man had given, along with the information on the microchip, and saw that it matched. But that soul, in that moment, Instead of asking, what's wrong with you, old man? Turned to him and said, sir, what happened? What's going on? How can I help you? And the man began to sob. He cried so hard, he was heaving. And when he came to reconcile himself, he says, this is Joshua. I've had Joshua since he was eight weeks old. Now he's 15. I have cancer. And I'm going into an assisted living place, and they won't let me keep my dog. So I thought, if I said he was a stray, instead of the fact that I had to surrender him, it would give him more time to find a home. And in that place of understanding, the staff member could pick up the phone and call us at the sanctuary, and I will never forget. Holding Joshua in my arms as we went our way, and the old man went his way, he knowing that his baby boy, would end his life with dignity as he went to end his life. If we want to create connection with another and make a difference in the life of someone who may be suffering, we can start by asking them a question. And now we come to this point of expression. We oftentimes have feelings of love and support and caring, but if we don't express them, they do no good for the person that we want to hold them for. Connection is a verb, not a noun. It's active, not passive. And so we need to express ourselves. And there's lots of different ways that we can express ourselves. We can send a text. We can send an email. We can make a phone call. But I'm here to advocate that the most extraordinary and lasting and impactful way is the good old-fashioned handwritten note. And again, I'd like you to check that for me. How did you feel the time that you had received a handwritten note? And they always seem to arrive at the right and perfect moment. There is somebody near and dear to my life, and because my condition is something I still need to manage on an everyday life, and there are days in which the monster greets me in the morning, and I'm heavy of heart and mind, this person close to me knows that sometimes what hurts Woody the most is hard to see. It can't be seen, but sometimes what will help Woody the most is easy to do. And so she wrote me this note, and she said, Woody, I love you so much more than I could possibly ever show you. I truly can't imagine our family without you. I lately have felt sad because I don't know what I can do to help you. I don't understand depression. I don't feel like anyone really does. I have been researching to try and figure out what I can do to help. However, I have been reading and not been able to find anything, so I thought I would just reach out and write you a note to remind you that even though your depression may cause you to feel that you are not worthy, that that is the absolute farthest thing from the truth. I wanted to let you know that together we are a team and we can do this thing and I am ready to kick some depression (laughs) bootay. And then at the end, she writes to me and says, depression can't have you because you're ours. But here's the great 
power of connection. Connection creates hope and hope heals. The true power in connection is the flag is the fact that it is reciprocal. That connection is like a boomerang. As we create it with others, we experience it ourselves. The giver becomes the receiver in an Eden of camaraderie, a sanctuary of mutuality. And that, brothers and sisters, that is the place where hope lives. When we call forth another by name, we experience the bliss of recognition. When we take time to ask the why behind another's action, we find ourselves on the smooth and level ground of understanding. And when we send a timely, specific, authentic expression of our love and support, we are awash in the same sentiment that we offer. My new year is different than yours. I acknowledge. I acknowledge January 1st, but I celebrate August 31st. And every August 31st, I get in my vehicle and I drive back to that same spot. And I park my car and I walk to the midpoint of the Forest Hill Bridge. And I press my body up against that barrier. But I don't look down. I look up. And I give thanks. I give thanks to Almighty God for the life that I get to experience because of the connection that gave me hope, that turned me around to allow me to be here with you today. And when I go to leave, I come face to face with the emergency call box, the box that is painted this annoyingly splendid, brilliant yellow, a box that on the top of it has a sign, and that sign says, there is hope, make the call. Not a soul has jumped off that bridge who has picked up that phone. Such is the power of connection to create hope. Mental illness lies, but hope doesn't. Hope takes us by the hand and whispers to it, Beloved, you are loved, you are wanted, you are needed, you are worthy, you matter. I am here today because of hope. Hope that was created by the connection and the small and simple things that people have and continue to do in my life. For those present here today, I plead with you, there is hope. Make the call. Your condition is not your fault. Reach out to this. We will pull you forward from mental illness into the space of mental wellness. Together, we can turn the tables on the lying monster and have you experience the mental health that is your birthright. For the rest of us, our job is to answer that call. To answer the call with a commitment for recognition, understanding, and expression to leave this sacred place today and go out and be about our Father's work, to put curiosity before assumption, to put dignity before stigma, to fashion together a great net of compassion and cast it out far and wide to everyone that we meet. This sense suffering is almost always invisible. And in this way, by doing this to everyone we meet, we will gather up that soul, that brother and sister most in need, and as we pull them close and allow them to also experience the love of God, I promise you, you will hear in their thanksgiving, in their sweet exhale, them say, thank you, God. God bless.